filling in. Uh, speak our Lord. That's what we're here for this morning, is for Him to speak and us to listen. And before uh, we get into the message, there's another thing that's in your bulletin that today. It wasn't really an announcement, but it's a couple of them, an envelope and a flyer. And so before I get into the introduction to the message, we'll talk about that a little bit. I grew up in a more or less, I guess you say, independent Baptist church. Uh, we weren't Southern Baptists, but we, we did have um, an association like, like the Palestine Baptist Association. I went to Palestine Church. Um, but whenever we had missionaries, the way missionaries got out into the field, whether locally or uh, worldwide, was they went on, I'll probably say it wrong, deposition. Deputation, thank you. Deputation, the other one was like uh, uh, core, yeah. So say it one more time. Deputation. Deputation. Basically going out and looking for money. So when God called them to the mission field, they would have to go out and find the money to get them there. And we have some friends who are in, they're not missionaries as such now, they're in Africa. And the first thing you have to do is get $10,000 for each person to get back. And that has to go into the fund so if the government collapses while you're gone, they don't lose you that you can get out of the country and not get killed. So they have to get at least, so for them, uh, I think it ended up being like $60,000 saved up because they had several kids just to get out of the country. And then they need their, their annual expenses, which they don't have to worry about insurance because nothing, they're in Africa, nobody takes, they don't know what insurance is, you just pay for it as you go. Uh, and for all you ladies who have delivered babies, she got to deliver hers pretty much without anything. I mean. No, no, you don't go to the hospital because you don't deliver babies in the hospital. You deliver them at home. So she delivered all of hers away from medical care. So lots of things go on. But that's, that's the way some churches get their, their missionaries out. But being Southern Baptists, we cooperate with other churches. And so our offerings, part of our offerings, go to help support Southern Baptist activities. That We are a part of that convention. And... Uh, you, are, you have in your bulletins the Annie Armstrong flyer here and then a little envelope. Annie Armstrong is taken annually this time of year. I remember Annie Armstrong and Easter because they're all vowels. That's how I can remember that. And, and this is offerings that go strictly only to North American missions. Our cooperative gifts go to the convention and they, they use it for operations and, and their budget for missionaries. But Annie Armstrong is for special offering for North American missionaries. And then in the, around Christmas time, Wadi Moon is an offering specifically for international missions. In the last, uh, I think, two years, three years, especially the International Mission Fund had dropped down. And so they brought back something around 10 or 20 percent of the missionaries that we support in other countries because they just did not have the funds. So as we contribute to the, to the Southern Baptist uh, in special offerings to Annie Armstrong and Wadi Moon, we we're helping keep those missionaries out in the field and not having to raise their own money. Um, this is a the flyer is just a prayer, not just, but it is a prayer a bulletin for seven, yeah, seven of our North American missions and then a, a special eighth day of prayer. So on uh, Palm Sunday, uh, pull this out, make sure you pull it out, and be praying for those missionaries each one of the days uh, leading up into Easter. And you don't have to wait until the end, but by the end, uh, please be praying for it. Last week, we uh, started in John. We talked about uh, John presenting Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah. And some of the key verses there is, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory that is of the only begotten and the Father, full of grace and truth. And John is using that introduction to say, God, God is with us. That's the beginning of the gospel. And Paul will know this saint who was a saint here on earth, now a saint in heaven, uh, who was our pastor for several years. He would do a little review, which was never a little review. You might hear the same message twice in a row. Because he said, I just want to review a little bit and get us caught up before I go on. And he'd preach almost the same message, a little different. But uh, going through Revelation took five years because... He was really impassioned about Revelation and he would he'd back up and hit some points and then he remember some other stuff he wished he would say and kept on going. But I, uh, I was affected by that just like I was affected by my dad never having screwdrivers. So I have screwdrivers all over my house, my truck, uh, probably in my pocket right now. 
So, uh, in the same way, I was affected by him. He loved the church, but sometimes he would preach the same message. Like, it takes him a month to get through a few verses. I'm going to try not to do that. So, someday Paul may look at me and say, John, you're acting like Carl. So. <laughs> but I don't know what that means. But John is going to present Christ as, as the, the um, offering for the, uh, the Son of God, the one who came to be offered for our sins, the Messiah. And, and so he, he unfolds him as that. And don't, don't get too worried. We're going to get up, long introduction to get up to a, to a short message uh, about Christ's ministry here on earth. But in all the Gospels, except John, they record the temptation of Christ. It's not necessary to record it to John because he is being presented as God and God cannot be tempted with, by evil, neither does he tempt any man. So John doesn't record that because for God... That's, that's a, like a non-entity. Then, after, after John the writer begins the gospel, John the Baptist sees Christ coming and says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is an important statement. This is, this is the whole purpose of Christ coming, is to be the payment for our sins. And that's, that's in chapter 1. Then Jesus, after He's been announced as the Messiah, chooses His disciples, and then... He does his first miracle. It's a miracle at the wedding. He returns the water uh, that they had into wine because they'd run out of wine for the celebration of the wedding. So his disciples are chosen. He goes to the marriage. He, he changes the water to wine, the first miracle, in Cana of Galilee. And then he goes to the temple. And if you read the other Gospels, you know that when he was a young, young boy, he went to the temple when they were there for Passover, that this is when he's an adult. He goes to the pass, Passover, or goes to the temple, I'm sorry, goes to the temple, and uh, does a purging. He is coming to say that, you know, this is my place, this is my house, this is where I dwell, and you made it to, into a den of thieves. So he comes into the temple, uh, purges the temple, turns over the money changers' tables, and then Nicodemus comes and talks to him. Talks to him. Now, if you think about the commission that Christ is going to give his disciples, which we have already, it is to go to Judea, or to go to Jerusalem first, and then Judea, and to Samaria, and finally to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, John is kind of giving us that example. He goes to Nicodemus, a Jew, in Jerusalem. He brings the gospel message to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus, we believe, I believe, over time, became a Christian, but at this point, Nicodemus is still unsure. So Christ has gone to the Jews, to Nicodemus. Then, Christ goes up to Samaria. He talks to a Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. So you can see how the gospel is going. It goes to Nicodemus. It goes to Samaria, the woman of Samaria. She is unquestionably saved and, and wants to follow Christ, but he leaves her there as a uh, kind of missionary evangelist to the Samaritans. And then he goes to the nobleman, the nobleman's son in Capernaum. So a Gentile. So we've had the message go. We've had Christ go to the Jews to the Samaritans, and now to the Gentiles. So very quickly in John, Christ has, has shown his word going out to, to the whole, uh, essentially to the whole world. He's gotten the whole Jewish world taken care of. Then things take a turn. He heals a sick man on the Sabbath day. This is, if you're trying to kind of follow along, we're up to about John chapter 5 now. Um, he, this is his, uh, I believe, third miracle of his turned the water to wine, he's healed the noble man's son, and now he heals the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And uh, this is kind of interesting because it's the Sabbath, and, and the Sabbath we know to the Jews is a day of rest, but Jesus is getting ready to, to change things a little bit for the, the Jews. Uh, the Sabbath was along the same lines of circumcision, uh, some of the dietary restrictions that they, they had, and Jesus is showing them there's something different coming now, and one of the obvious things is we don't worship on the Sabbath anymore. The Sabbath was on the seventh day. That's when God rested. We were worship now on the, the first day of the week when Christ rose again. Because Jesus killed this man on the Sabbath, the Jews seek to kill him. And this is kind of a, a major point in the Gospels. Now, in chapter 5, the Jews are seeking to kill Christ because he healed this man. He had done good works on the Sabbath. Jesus gives his first message. And his first message to the people is that I and the, 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 I and the 
the Father, God, have a special relationship between each other. Uh, I am come in my Father's name. Uh, he's essentially equating himself with the Son of God, which he was. And the Jews wanted to kill him because no one can say that they are the Son of God. So the, the Jews are even more anxious to uh, do something to him because they are now seeing in him the claims of Godhood, which is what John is all about. After that, Jesus feeds 5,000. And this is, this is the fifth miracle. Um, a big deal. It's recorded in all the Gospels, of Jesus feeding all the 5,000. And when he does that, the people's hearts are kind of changed. They see somebody, they, they're kind of seeing this Messiah. This guy's going to rule, and he's going to take care of us. He's going to provide us for food, provide us food. And so it's like, hey, we need to make sure that, that he is the king, because this is going to be a great deal. He, it's not time yet. It's not time for him to be king. It's not time for him to be revealed as, as the king of all. So at this point, he slips away into the mountains to pray. And he sends his disciples across the Sea of Galilee uh, in a boat. Well, they are going, they are struggling again across the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus walks up to them in the night, uh, walking on the water, which is another miracle, which is actually, I guess I said fifth on the 5,000. This is his fifth miracle. Jesus walking on the water out to the disciples. Then, all the crowd that he had fed before, all those 5,000 and then some, which probably on, on the order of 20,000 people, come around to hear him on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The message is not as well received. This message, they have eaten the bread, the natural bread. The message gives now is, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat of me, you will perish. And at that point, Many of his disciples, many of those people who are following him, walk away from him. Um, that was a hard saying for them to hear, is that it wasn't about them, it was about him. And so the, the people began to wander away, and, and some of the most, I guess, heart-pulling scripture, and this is a message in itself that would be good on its own, is when the people are going away, he looks at his disciples and say, says, are you going to go away too? And this isn't the message this morning, but it's, it's a very important question. Are, are you going to be offended with Christ and walk away? And the answer from probably Peter is, Lord, where can we go? You're the only one that has words of life. And, and, and so his, his core disciples stay with him. But there's still this undercurrent of the Jews trying to kill him, trying to... Uh, wipe out his ministry because he's, he's upsetting their apple cart. Then Jesus gives a, another message, his second message, only the second message he's given in John. And this is when he's in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And in this one, he, he mentions that, uh, that he is the light of the world. Now, if you remember back in John 1, we talked about where it says Christ was the light of the world and light came into darkness and darkness could not comprehend it or overcome it. So he's talking, he's going back to that first chapter coming up and saying, I am the light of the world. Of the world. And, and with this message, uh, again, he, he equates himself with, with godness and, and the disciples, or the, the Jews, the Jews send some of their cadre out to try to arrest him and bring him in and question him. But it doesn't work out. Then, we're up to chapter 9 already. Uh, Christ is in Jerusalem again, and there's a man who's born blind, which as I read this, I believe, if I remember right, Russ did a message on this not too long ago, in John chapter 9, about the man who's born blind, and the disciples look at him and say, okay, who made the mistake here? Well, was it this man, or was it his parents? Because he was born blind. And Jesus said something that's really important, and that was, it wasn't either one of those. But here's, here's what he said. This man has not sinned. Neither have his parents sinned. But this is why. So that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And we are seeing what's going, what, a very important part of what the message, the gospel message is to us. And that is the gospel message is not us. The gospel message is Christ. And he is saying this, it doesn't matter, but we're all sinners, and I'm paraphrasing heavily here, we're all sinners, 
it doesn't matter if this man stands to his parents, but here's what's going to happen. You're going to see who I am because I'm going to get sight for the blind. The gospel message is about Christ. And Christ is, is going to do a great work. And because he does this great work on the Sabbath, the Pharisees are going to be upset with him again. So the Pharisees are all over him because, hey, you healed this man on the Sabbath. This is where they go get the parents and say, hey, is this your kid? It's, there's, there's a great big stir among the Pharisees. And then Christ gives his next message. And this is a message about the good shepherd. And at the end of that message, he says, I and my father are one. He had equated himself with God. The Jews are just beside themselves now, the, the Pharisees, because he had equated himself again with God instead of seeking to kill him. Then we get to chapter 11. And that's where we are this morning. It won't be that, it won't be that bad, I promise. It could be. I don't know. It could be real bad. But in these first 10 chapters, and I had been saved and studying the Bible for probably 20 years. And I realized from chapter 11 to chapter 21 is like the last two months of Jesus' life. 1 through 11, 1 through 10, 1 up to 11, is his whole ministry going to John up until this time of the betrayal, denial, crucifixion, resurrection, and post-resurrection. So John is trying to get us to the point where the sacrifice for sin is made by the perfect Lamb of God. And Lazarus, Lazarus' death and resurrection is a means for Christ to show what's getting ready to happen. This is his seventh miracle in John. Christ did a bunch of miracles. This is just the seventh one, and it's the last one in John, because it's the last one really that's needed, unless you consider his resurrection a miracle. Uh, it's the last one that's needed to show who he is, because he's shown his power over nature, turning the water to wine. He shows his power over illness, by healing the lame man and the blind man. And now he's going to show his power over death, by raising Lazarus. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany. The town of Mary was just Martha. It was this Martha, or this Mary, I'm sorry, it was this Mary that anointed the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. This was a great sign of humility. The servant would do this, wash their feet, and she washed his feet herself, one of the householders with her own hair, uh, showing her humility. Now, this actually happens later, but John is just telling us, this is this, this family's house. Therefore his sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So he's, they were telling him, they sent word to Christ wherever he was, hey, Lazarus is sick, near death, you need to come and help him. Um, this shows, I think, and, and we'll see several more verses, where this shows the, the closeness of relationship that they had. Uh, Christ really had no place to stay. Bethany was near Jerusalem, and this was almost like his home away from home. This is one of the places he did get to stay. And uh, before we start verse 4, which gets into the, the real point that I was going to make, points I was going to make today, let's have a prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word that you give us. And it's not just a collection of stories, Father, but it is the story of your love for us that you showed to us through the giving of yourself in Christ for our sins. Lord, we don't understand that completely. Uh, we won't understand it completely until we see you and see what you left in order to come to redeem us for, for, from our sins we have sinned against you. And Father, as we give your word out this morning, help us to learn from Mary and Martha and the disciples what our place of service is before you. And Father, how we ourselves behave before you. Help our hearts to be changed, to be more like Christ, and to have a greater faith in him. We ask these things in his name. Amen. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of Man might be glorified thereby. And if you know, if you know the story at all, um, we know that Lazarus died. That Christ said, right here, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. So he's saying, hey, death is not the victor here. This is just this is just part of what must be done for God to be glorified and the Son 
to be glorified in Him. And when we see events around us, lots of times we interpret those events by the way that they affect us. In this event that's getting ready to be brought out to us in John, Lazarus died. We, we have had a lot of people pass away. Our, our Saul Max passed away, so remember that family. Uh, Yvonne Golf has passed away. And those events affect those people, and they can't help but affect those people. My mom passed away. It, it, it hurts you. It, it, it affects you. When people are injured, it, it can cause you to... Uh, like when Sam was living. The, the things that happened to Sam caused Ada pain because she saw the person she loved have problems and, and it affects us. And uh, there, there's a story about how, how we perceive events. Um, some of you are old enough to know what dinks are. Do you know what a dink is? No women come, no kids. Have you ever heard that before? That was a term from the 80s. A long time ago for some of you. An eternity ago for some. When we got married, we were dinks. We, she had worked, I had worked. We had no kids because we just got married. And, and so when we were at honeymoon, we went to Hawaii. And we were in Hawaii. We went to the, the Big Island first because that's just the easiest place to go. Then we flew to Maui, I think, and then, and then home. Yeah. So Maui is one of the smaller islands with a smaller airport. We were getting ready to take off. And planes are loaded pretty heavy to go across the ocean. Uh, lots of fuel, lots of people, lots of baggage. Which if you ever go to Hawaii, don't take much baggage because it's not, it's not cold. Unless you go to the mountains, and it could be, but pack light. We're getting ready to fly back, leave Maui, and the pilot gets on and says, uh, the winds are not favorable, the plane is heavy, we can't top off with fuel, so we're going to have to fly to Oahu first and then to Los Angeles. And somebody behind me said, boy, that's just going to ruin the evening. And I thought, no, landing about 200 miles short of the west coast would ruin the evening. <laughs> a little couple hour delay is not going to be that big a deal. <laughs> but it just shows us that we see problems from our own set of lenses. And they didn't look at the bigger picture of this is what the problem is, not my time, but we're not going to make it. And sometimes I think we're that way with our Christian law. God has us do something. God puts us in a situation and we look at it through our eyes and say, God, why are you doing this to me? Not remembering that it's about Him and not about us. It's Him that we're trying to glorify. It's Him who deserves the glory. And we are just His servants, His humble servants. Like Mary who washed His feet with her hair, we are just Your servants, Lord. What do You want us to do? and help us to do it. So Christ is telling him, this is telling his disciples, this sickness is not for Lazarus' death, but this is what this sickness is for. It's for my glory and for the glory of the Father. So the disciples were, the, the family I'm sure is looking at this through their own eyes. Lazarus is sick. Christ can make it better. Go get Christ. Christ talks with these disciples a little bit. He says, now, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. So it confirms what they said. You're, the, the servants that you love is sick. And, and Christ did love them. When he, heard his, when he had heard this, therefore, that he was sick, he go two more days in the same place where he was. And then after that, he said, let us go to Judea. And his disciples said to him, Master, and I'm going to paraphrase here, lately the Jews didn't want to kill you. Do you know that? And if they kill you and we're with you, you know, this, this could be bad for us. Whose eyes were his disciples looking at the problem through? Their own eyes. Jesus says, we have to go now. If we die, we die. This isn't what he says, but this is what we have to do. We have to do the will of the Father. And Jesus said to comfort them, aren't there 12 hours in the day? If any man walks in the day, he stumbles not. Because we see the light of this world. If man walks in the night and stumbles because there's no light in him. So he's telling them, these people want to kill us, they're in the darkness. It's not physical light or physical dark, but these people who want to kill us are in darkness. And the darkness will not overcome the light. That's what he had said in the very, very beginning of the, of the scripture, is that darkness cannot overcome the light. And he says to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. That I will go that I may awake him out of sleep. 
And the disciples, still clueless as they, they are, and we are today, said, well, good, he's resting. Everything's going to be okay. And Christ said, no, Lazarus is dead. Okay, let's just be clear. Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad, for your sakes, that I was not there. And this is going to be confusing them because they know what kind of power Christ has. And he's saying, I'm glad that he's dead. And, and this is going on. Because, to this intent, this is why. So that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go and see him. And this, this is a, a funny, this is how scripture is funny to me. Thomas says, So we're going to go die with him? Is that what it is? He's dead. We're going to go up there. They're going to stone us. We're, we're all going to be dead. Then Jesus leaves to go toward Martha. <coughs> when he gets to Bethany, near Bethany, which is, uh, I think it said, three miles from Jerusalem, in verse 19 it says, Many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out to meet him. But Mary sat still at the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And I, we don't know how this was received. Um, we, we can imagine ways that people may, may receive things, may understand them. Christ, knowing the intentions of all of our hearts, but there is, a, there is a sense here, kind of like when, when Adam sinned, God, this is your fault. If you'd been here like we asked you to be, Lazarus would still be alive. And in grief, we may say something like that. Is, is Lord, I need this, and I need it now. It's like the J.C. Wentworth commercial, which I, I need to do for a little separation here. Everybody seen those where they sing and say, it's my money and I want it now. And that's the way we approach God sometimes. It's, God, you have these promises and I want them. Right? You need to do this, God. You need to do it now. And we've forgotten point one. And that is, it's not about us. It's about Him. But she mentions, she shows, she displays great faith. When she says, but I know that even now, whatever you ask, God will give it to you. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know. He will rise in the last resurrection day. Martha said the right words. Uh, if you were here, Lord, he would still be alive. Now, I have that kind of faith in you that you can keep him alive. <coughs> and I know now, Lord, that you can do whatever you want to by, by asking the Father. She understood the grammar that she used. She knew how the words went together. She assented to the truth of the matter, but she did not know what she was saying. And I, I tell Lauren this sometimes about college. I learned this, in, this is what I learned in college. You can hear somebody talk to you, and you can understand that they have the subjects and the verbs in the right place, and that's English and not some foreign language, although some of the classes, I wonder if it's foreign language or English, but it is not a part of you. You do not understand it. You cannot put it into practice. And I think that's where Martha was with her faith. She knew all the right words. She could regurgitate what the, the teacher had taught her the day before, but she didn't understand what she was saying. <coughs> and this is like, I mean, Lazarus' resurrection is a big deal, but this is like the pendulum. When Jesus responds to her in verse 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is the gospel. He's going to play it out for them so that they can see him die on the cross and they can see him resurrect. But he is, John has given us the gospel message. And if you believe that, not just understand the grammar, not just the sense that it is true, but if you apply that to your lives, you'll be saved. 
And she says in verse 27, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. She has sensed that what he said is true, but she does not yet believe it. Now what does Jesus say he's going to do when he comes? He said, uh, first in verse 4, this sickness is not to death, but for the glory of God. And in verse 15 he says, I'm glad for your sakes I was not there, to the intent that you may believe. This is what this whole purpose is, is of the resurrection, the of raising Lazarus is that they might believe him. They've said all the right words, it has just not been internalized yet. And when she had so said, she went away and her sister Mary came secretly, saying, Master, the Master has come and calls for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose and came to him. Now Jesus was not yet coming to the town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. And the Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her. When they saw Mary, they rose up hastily and went out, and followed her, saying, She goes to the grave to weep there. And this shows that Lazarus, and this is important, that Lazarus was popular among the, the Jews, and that he was probably wealthy, because when you had someone die, mourners would come. If you didn't have enough mourners, you'd pay somebody to come and mourn with you. So they, there was lots of mourners, so probably popular, probably wealthy both. And when Mary comes, she kind of does the same stuff. She fell down his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her and the others weeping with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. Christ has two more weeks left in his ministry on earth. His disciples don't know who he is. His best friends don't know who he is. And as man, he's getting ready to go. And what am I going to leave behind? As God, he knows. But as man, it's like, my ministry is, is nearly over. I know that as God. But, but they still don't get it. It's, and he was troubled in his heart. He says, where have you laid him? And they come and show him the place where he laid. And Jesus wept. Now this kind of weeping, this kind of mourning, is not the kind of mourning of grief and sorrow of loss. Because I would not cry for someone I knew was going to be alive in the next 10 minutes. He knows what's going to happen. He knows Lazarus is going to raise again. But he is deeply moved in himself, and he cries. Not so much for the loss of Lazarus, but for the complete <coughs> lack of knowledge of who he is. Even though they say the words, it's not in their hearts yet. And then the Jews did like we would do, and they see him crying and say, Oh, how I loved him. And that's what we would think. And then some of them said, He calls blind people to see and lame to walk. Couldn't he have kept this man from dying? Even then, some of the Jews there are scoffing at him, saying, He is, he is lame. He is, he is not able to do this. <clears throat> then Jesus, again, burning himself, comes to the grave. There's a cave with a stone on it. And let's flip back. I'm going to flip back here. Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not die. But I know that even now, whatever you ask, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know that he will again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives in me and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who should come into the world. Now I'm going to ask you to prove it. Roll away the stone. But Lord, he is dead and he stinks. You're going to embarrass my family by opening this stone and having this stench of my dead brother out here? Did Jesus have to ask her to roll away the stone? No, because in two weeks he's going to do it himself. He was trying her faith and saying, you say I'm the resurrection, now do you believe that I'm the resurrection? Roll away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said he, he's, he's been dead for four days. It's going to be bad. And Jesus says to her, 
Did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? This is the reason I came. I came so that God might be glorified. And they took away the stone where the dead man was laid, and Jesus lifted his eyes. And he said, Father, I thank thee that you have heard me. This isn't the first time Jesus prayed about this instance. Jesus prayed about this instance four days ago. And God said, wait, let him die, and I will glorify myself through his resurrection. That's what Jesus knew. But for the benefit of those around him, he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people to stand by, I say this, that they may believe that you have sent me. <clears throat> miracles are unusual occurrences. And God does miracles. Miracles, I believe, happen today. But they don't happen for the way most of us think they do. What was the very, very first thing God said or Christ said was going to happen? God would be glorified. That's the first reason for a miracle, is to glorify God. The second reason for a miracle, so they may believe. If those aren't happening, I'm dubious of the miracles that occur. But it's to bring glory to God and so that we may believe. And when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead came forth, bound head and foot in grave clothes. And his face was bound. He said, loose him and let him go. And this is how effective the miracle was. And many of the Jews who came to Mary and had seen this thing that Jesus did, believed on him. That was the reason he did this. He proclaimed the gospel. I am the resurrection and the life. And he demonstrated that he was the gospel. I am the resurrection. I am the life. And I'll stop there. But the very next verse talks about the ones who didn't believe and what they want to do to me. When you look at your life, are you like Martha? Are you able to regurgitate all the things that the Bible says about Christ and about who we are and what we are and who we should be and how we should live? And when it comes right down to it, we're not. Martha says she understood all these things. And, and if I was listening to her, I'd say, Martha, you are right on. You got this. You understand all the details of serving Christ. But when Christ said, now, show me. Trust me. Put that to work. What do we do? Most of us say, well, that, that could be embarrassing. Why, why don't we do that? That's, that's not comfortable. What if God knows that your plans or to work to retirement and hit all the states and all the national parks. And he says, you know what? You're going to pastor. You, you may never get to do that. When you get to the point where that's okay, you're starting to mature a little bit in Christ. Are we asking God to serve us? Lord, if you'd been here on time, if you'd done this like you're supposed to do, this would have never happen. Are we making God work on our schedule, having Him be our servant versus us being His servant? Is that how we live our Christian life? And is our Christian life about what God does for me more than what it is, what I do for God, and that His, His name be glorified? That's the questions I want you to ask yourselves today before we go home. So if musicians can come up, Father coming up, remember this. Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. If you came here this morning dead, Christ has made this offer. Whosoever lives and believes in me, will never die. Lazarus died again physically. But Lazarus' spirit never died because of believed Jesus Christ. And that is my hope and prayer for you this morning. Is that you accept
this Christ who has made this offer for eternal life. Let's, let's stand. And, uh, I surrender all. I'm not sure what page. Turn to 